So yes, I'm going to switch gears a little bit today and we're going to be talking about our gut, what's going on in the gut, a little bit of uh, uh, defining dysbiosis and how your gut microbial patterns can really uh, affect uh, your immunity and your resistance to infection. So this is a quote from E.E. Uh, e. Meshnikov back in 1900. He's coined the father of orthobiosis. And in naturopathic medicine, this is kind of the foundation, you know, looking at the gut. Um, it, it, we're still looking now, and it's catching on more in mainstream medicine, but we still don't exactly know what orthobiosis is. What is dysbiosis? What is a healthy gut? But to kind of take a step back, I wanted to talk a little about uh, just some interesting gut facts here. There are over 400 species of microbiota in the intestinal tract, and it totals about 15 pounds of your weight, 15 pounds of bacteria in your gut. That's more than any organ in your body, aside from the skeletal muscle. There's also more microbes in our human intestinal tract than there are stars in the galaxy, and it exceeds all of the cells in our body combined. So it's a lot of gut bugs here. There's also a lot of nerve cells in the human intestine, and it equals the amount found in the spinal cord. We have all kinds of neurotransmitters that are contained within the gut, and also the surface area of the human intestinal tract is equal to that of uh, regulation singles tennis court. So this is a quote by, let's see, my picture didn't show up here. Uh, the Second Brain, there was a picture here of the book cover, but The Second Brain by Michael Gershon. This is a really great book if anyone's interested in wanting to you know, read more about what's going on in your, in your gut and, and its, its relationship to our um, uh, neuroendocrine function. But this is a quote here I'm just going to read to you. Consider the lowly gut in its nervous system. The bowel is just not the kind of organ that makes the pulse race. No poet would ever write an ode to the intestine, and to be frank, the popular consensus is that the colon is a repulsive piece of anatomy. Its shape is nauseating, its contents disgusting, and it smells bad. The bowel is a primitive, slimy, snake-like thing. Its body lies coiled within the belly, and it slithers when moves. In brief, the gut is despicable and reptilian, not at all like the brain from which wise thoughts emerge. Clearly, the gut is an organ only a scientist would love. And I really like this quote because I am a scientist, and I do love the gut, and I talk about it every day, clinically, and we have research associated with it daily. So yes, I do love the gut. So uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, some, some numbers here are coming out. Is about 75% of our immune cells in the body are localized in the gut. 100 trillion bacteria in this human gut. Starts up here in the stomach with about 10 to the third uh, bacteria per gram. Uh, with the acid-resistant organisms. We go down into the small intestine, still about the same amount of bacteria. Anaerobes are starting to come up in number. As we move further down, we're starting to see most of the um, anaerobes present here. And again, we see the numbers doubling. It goes about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 grams of bacteria. And then moving into the colon, it's strict anaerobes. 98% of the gut bacteria are anaerobic. And in the stool sample, we see about double, uh, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13th bacteria per gram in stool. So I don't really know what to say about this slide. It just makes me laugh every time I see it. I'm talking about poop, so I figured I'd put it up here. So the big picture, really, is there's a lot going on in our gut. And sometimes it's really overlooked. And we want to... to start realizing how are we, we going to be able to assess gut health? What, how do we look at gut health? Do we need to look at all, you know, all of these microbes that are associated? It seems like you would because they all are interconnected here. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about ways that we can assess our gut microbiota. Uh, typically in the past, still, I don't know if any of you guys do stool testing, but all the way up until the recent uh, times there has been culture. It's a culture technique. If a patient collects a stool sample and a culture broth, sends it to the lab, and the, the lab grows the, the, the culture up in plates, and you get to see what is there. The only flaw to that is that it's, if your anaerobic bacteria are there, they'll die in the presence of air. 
So you really can't get a good look at 98% of what's in your stool. So this next generation in stool analysis is looking at the DNA of these microbes. It doesn't matter if they're still alive by the time they get to the lab, and you'll be able to take a snapshot of what really is in the gut by looking at its DNA. Here is a study that came out, or a paper that came out in Gut in 2006, talking about this molecular revolution in the study of intestinal microflora. This is jumping leaps and bounds in our ability to, to really get a good look at what's going on. This is a recent article that came out in Proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences, uh, kind of a case study showing that there's a correction of bacterial dysbiosis, and it was discovered by looking. Uh, at the DNA of these microbes, which we never could do before. We could look at the lactobacillus and bifidobacter here, what we normally have commonly seen on stool tests and cultures. And now we are able to identify all of these other ones you can see, and, and, and restore balance that way. So what is this new molecular revolution technology we're talking about? It's using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. This was developed back in the 80s. And it's been used in research institutions for a while now, and it's just catching on in, in the mainstream laboratories. But we're looking at the 16S and 23S ribosomal RNA gene sequences, and I'm going to talk a little bit short, you know, a quick snippet about that in a minute. Hybridization techniques, and this really allows us to be very sensitive and specific because we can pick sequences uh, of these specific bacteria or parasites or yeast or whatever you're wanting to pick up. So advantages of PCR versus culture. Uh, one difference is you only have to collect one specimen. I know in culture techniques, you'd have to collect several specimen. Uh, the DNA uh, is a lot more sensitive here. We can detect as few as five cells per gram compared to the 25,000 cells per gram that you would need to detect using culture techniques. So that's 5,000 times more sensitive. Again, I mentioned we're able to identify the anaerobes using DNA technology, which is the majority of our gut bacteria. Uh, transport, growth and transport. This is something that that's, we started paying attention to. Uh, you know, you collect in culture techniques, you collect the stool sample in a culture tube, and it's got a nutritive broth in it to keep the bacteria alive in the transport to the laboratory. Well, what happens in that transport? They've got food that are feeding these bacteria, these yeasts. We found that this nutritive broth selectively feeds candida species. So we think that maybe for decades, we've been overdiagnosing candida species due to this growth and transport effect. It also, uh, with the growth of some organisms, suppresses others. You could get false negatives, you get false positives, depending on which grows. So that's a major difference here in wanting to move away from the culture technique. And again, it's, it's a lot more sensitive. You only have to require five, one to five bacterial cells instead of 1,000 to 5,000 for culture. I'm not going to go real in depth into the, the molecular technique here, but this is a structure of a bacterial genome. We're looking at the ribosomal RNA genes, the, uh, and they're separated by internal transcribed space. Or this, this, let's see, I'm going to go to this one. This, explains it a little bit easier to see here. This is the um, DNA of a bacteria, and this is the ribosomal RNA genes, the 16S and 23S. These are specific to each species of bacteria. So each you know, lactobacillus has a different 16S and 23S than bifidobacteria does, and they're conserved throughout the, the genre. So all lactobacillus species have the same piece of 16S DNA. A refresher to any of you who don't know PCR or a, a quick course on what PCR is. Basically, uh, you take a piece of DNA, you heat the DNA sample, it separates it into two strands. You put in primers and nucleotides and attack polymerase, which is a, helps uh, make this strand grow. And the, with the nucleotides and the primer and the polymerase, you get another strand of double-stranded DNA.